Welcome to this presentation covering OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Act, as well as workers' compensation law. We won't get to workers' compensation law in this particular lecture, but we will in a later lecture. So let's get started. Um, OSHA is about keeping the workplace safe, and this is a major, major concern for industry, both from a legal compliance standpoint, as well as a human standpoint. Obviously, the people who are being injured are the employees of the entity of the business, are the colleagues of the people who work there. And so certainly on a, on a hum, human level, that uh, can be a tragic circumstance, but also on a third level, which is a business sense. Um, there are costs associated with workplace injuries that go beyond legal compliance and just our humanity for other, uh, for, for our fellow human beings. It is a major concern as we can see here today. The statistics tell a pretty clear story that we need to be concerned as HR managers and legal professionals about is our workplace, are our workplaces safe? Okay, so let's get started on OSHA. We're going to go over an overview of OSHA, kind of how it works. We're going to look at a few specific standards, although certainly there's lots and lots of specific standards, so we won't be doing a very deep dive in that. Then we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about the general duty clause and a couple of other clauses that deserve uh, some specific attention or, or some greater attention. The, the general duty clause that will be our main focus. We'll talk about employer defenses and we'll talk about uh, how to avoid these types of, of, of issues arising and also how OSHA enforces these particular rules. Um, we won't be able to finish our OSHA presentation in this lecture, but in a subsequent lecture we'll talk about the scope and application of the statute as well as record-keeping requirements that exist um, in the area of OSHA compliance. And then in another lecture we'll talk about workers' compensation. One thing I want to flag to you about workers' compensation is that Texas's system is very unusual. We really stand alone with the other 49 states with our system of workers' compensation coverage. Oklahoma has some features similar to ours, but really even they aren't at the our different system than what we have. And so what you learn in the textbook really doesn't so much apply to us. And so um, uh, this is really your opportunity to learn how we work. You will be tested on this material, so be sure to watch that lecture and pay, pay attention carefully to that. The stuff in the textbook won't be that helpful for you when it comes time for tests. So let's begin. So the statute that we're going to be focusing on today is OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. This does get to be a little confusing because there are two things that we call OSHA. We call this the, the statute that we're going to be talking about OSHA. We also talk about the agency that administers the statute. We call it OSHA because it's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So, uh, Look for context clues when I use the term OSHA. If it sounds like I'm talking about a law or, or regulations or something, it's going to be this. If I'm talking about human beings doing stuff or organizations doing stuff, I'm obviously talking about the administration. I'm going to try to flag it when I use the term, but be aware that that can cause a bit of a problem. In most of the statutes that we've talked about today, the statute was passed either in the 30s or the 40s, maybe the 60s, maybe the early 70s. But this one was a late one to the, to the table. We certainly have statutes that were later than this, like um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, for example, and USERA is another one that's later. But uh, this was late coming, and we'll see that because it was um, on the later side, um, some of the aspects of its schema is going to be different than what we've seen before. Uh, this is an example of more aggressive government regulation than we saw, say, with Title VII. Um, before this law was passed, there wasn't a lot of safety rules out there for um, um, employers to follow. There was kind of a few patchworks here and there in very risky industries like, say, mining. Uh, but for the most part, there were not a lot of safety features. Some states had safety features, and certainly all employers had an incentive to have safe and work environments because of the workers' compensation statutes. But this one was kind of the first kind of full press into this this area and so we'll be looking at it from that perspective but before we go any farther I want to talk a little bit about the focus of this class 
The statutes that we've talked about to date have been things that are the are in the purview of an HR department. They're the things that HR professionals deal with, and they are the things that uh, HR attorneys and, and employment law attorneys and um, uh, uh, paralegals who practice in this area routinely deal with. That is the focus of their practice and their attention. OSHA is an important topic in HR, but it's not really an HR topic. Um, meaning, when I say that, I mean it's not just for the HR department. Um, risk management, loss prevention, those departments um, are the ones who are perhaps more involved in OSHA compliance in most organizations. Line management has a very important role in OSHA um, administration. So when we talk about the statute, I'm not going to do as deep a dive into the nitty gritty stuff as I would if we were talking about Title VII or something like that. And again, the reason is that HR professionals usually aren't the people doing the deep, deep dive in these areas. Now, certainly organizations can be run differently, and I'm sure there are companies in which the HR department and not the loss prevention department is a leader in this function. And so I apologize if you happen to be in one of those areas and you maybe need a bit of a deeper level of instruction. Certainly those resources are available to you if you have an interest in them. Um, but we're not going to do it in this course. We just don't have the resources or the time to do that. Another aspect of OSHA that I think is important to keep in mind is that while all employers are covered by OSHA, Certainly the focus of OSHA is industrial and warehouse and manufacturing, um, the blue collar type of disciplines in the workforce. Yes, uh, white collar environments uh, do sometimes have OSHA implications. We see that with sick building syndrome. We see that with carpal tunnel issues. Um, we see this with um, office uh, uh, supplies that, that that may have some some safety implications such as you know white out paper or toner or things along those lines but you know what most of the most of the activity that OSHA focuses on is the stuff where people can get badly hurt and let's face it in a white collar environment there's just not a lot of workplace hazards um, that can really result in serious, serious injuries. So uh, that's another reason that we're not doing quite as deep a dive because many of us will be working in environments where OSHA just isn't as much of a focus. But if you happen to be uh, working for an employer or uh, providing legal advice for an employer that is primarily involved in in industrial type settings, it may make sense for you to do a bit deeper dive at this time or at some point in your career, not necessarily at this moment in time, right, right here. Um, so OSHA's focused on providing some minimum workplace safety standards. This doesn't mean, of course, that an employer can't provide a higher degree of safety. Generally speaking, OSHA permits that. Now, there are some times where OSHA says, you've got to do it this way, and the employer might say, well, we think we know a safer way of doing it. Well, usually if the safer way of doing it fully complies with the OSHA standard, then the employer can do more. But sometimes the safer thing or the thing that the employer thinks is safer is um, something that's going to somehow or another not fully comply with OSHA. It's a different way of doing it. And because it's different, it's not exactly what OSHA had in mind. Um, when an employer happens to be in that situation, it requires a careful consideration. Yes, there, we'll see in a few minutes that there are ways of doing that extra safe approach, even though it may not fully comply with OSHA. But it's a risky thing to do, and it's something that definitely uh, requires a lot of reflection and, and consideration before you take that step, if you choose to take that step. Well, let's go forward from here. So OSHA Act, I'm going to call it OSHA Act here, but most people again call it OSHA, is the principal federal regulate, reg, actually, this shouldn't be OSHA Act, I apologize here, let me switch this, the OSHA administration. I change this to law. The OSHA Act is a principal federal law governing the safety of private sector workplaces. Um, and that is a true statement. 
the, this act created three agencies. I care about you knowing about only two of these agencies, so I'm not going to ask you questions about this one. We have the Occupational Safe and Healthy Health Administration. It, it administers the act. It's a governmental agency, and you can see it's called OSHA, just like the statute is called OSHA. And then the other one is NIOSH. This stands for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. This is the agency that provides the scientific and technical support. Lots of employees of OSHA have a very sophisticated understanding of the science and the health issues that are involved in the analysis, but this is a, a group of folks who specialize in the hard science to figuring out how safe or how much benzene can be in the work environment and still for it to be safe. And so this really does involve the PhDs of the world doing this type of analysis. And so you will see NIOSH pretty routinely uh, discussed in the literature and you do need to know uh, what it is. And while well, I'm not going to, you know, give you 12 names of it, all very, very similar. You do need to know the concept behind NIOSH, that it provides a scientific and technical support for OSHA. Um, the, the goal of the act, as we've said before, is that employers need to safeguard the health of their employees, even if the result of this particular action is a substantial increase to the operating cost to the employer. Uh, one topic that you'll hear often discussed in law is the idea of cost-benefit analysis. How much bang are we getting for this, the buck that we're spending on a particular activity? I mean, this is a good business analysis. If I um, end up spending $10 million, but it saves me $12 million in costs, that's a good investment. If I spend $7 million, and because I spent $7 million, I earned uh, $9 million in profit, that also sounds like a good investment. And so we'll see this in the law pretty routinely that a cost benefit analysis can be powerful evidence that we're doing what we ought to do. Not so though in the OSHA area. We'll see the case that talks about this in more detail. But generally speaking, a cost benefit analysis isn't the way to prove to OSHA or to the court system that we didn't really need to do that extra thing. Even though we might say, well, gosh, you know, Bob, broke his arm because we didn't have the latest and greatest safety feature. And that cost Bob and the company X amount of money. But the safety feature would have been tremendously more expensive than uh, the, the cost that we incurred because of Bob's broken arm. Uh, the, the OSHA folks aren't gonna be that impressed by that argument. Generally speaking, cost benefit analysis isn't um, something that uh, employers are permitted to do under this particular statute. We actually see three levels of violation. We have the de minimis, non-serious, and serious violations. I'm not really going to talk about these here, uh, but if you happen to work in this literature, you will see these terms pretty regularly, and so it's helpful to understand kind of what they are and, and how, how they relate to one another. Obviously, de minimis is more of a technical violation. Non-serious sounds not very serious, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's a, a trivial issue either. And then, of course, we have the serious violations. And so these are the standards that in the statute that OSHA uses to separate things kind of into different categories. Um, because our workplace, our workforce is so diverse, the things we produce and how we produce them and in the quantities we produce, there are an insane number of standards out there. And the standards are very, very granular and uh, very, very scientific in many cases. Obviously, what happens is, of course, no one becomes an expert in all of the standards. Uh, a person specializes in the standards that are relevant to his or her workplace. Um, but even with all of these standards, literally thousands of them, it's just not possible for OSHA to predict every single standard or to have every single standard ready to go. For one thing, there's always new processes being invented, new products being developed. And so there's obviously going to be a lag time between the innovation and when OSHA can answer the questions about what, what is a safe way of doing this particular task. So the fill in the blank part is the general duty clause. I like to think about the general duty clause kind of like the common law. So the OSHA regs are like statutes. You know, if you think about the universe of safety rules out there, um, OSHA 
identifies a risk, so it comes up with a reg here, it identifies a risk, so it comes up with a reg here, it identifies a risk here, and here, and here, and here, and here. There's a delay between the time it identifies the risks and it develops the rule, it can be even several years. So sometimes something might be in the thinking about stage, but there's actually no rule yet. But you can see that there's still a fair amount of space that isn't filled up. Well, if we think about the common law as an analogy, the, um, the court systems fill in the blanks here. So let's say there's a dispute between Bob and Larry involving a topic that we don't have any statutes about. Well, the court isn't going to say, well, gosh, guys, don't have an answer for you. Too bad for you. Go talk to your, your legislators. Maybe they'll figure something out for you. No, the courts have to resolve the issue because even if the legislature were to spring into action to resolve Bob and Larry's problem, statutes generally cannot be retroactive. And so really a, a new statute isn't going to save or help Bob and Larry resolve their issue. The courts are going to have to fill in those blanks. Well, of course, the general duty clause doesn't have to do with courts. This is usually going to be an administrative agency issue. But the, the general, duty set, general duty clause says, listen, guys, we know, even though we've got a ton of stuff here, we're not going to anticipate everything. We're not going to have all the answers that you need. And so we're going to put on employers a, a global cons, a issue, a global responsibility to make sure their workplaces are generally safe. And we're going to call that the general duty clause. We're not going to have a ton of regulations in this area because we don't know what you're going to need to do, honestly, as employers uh, to anticipate all these issues. We don't have a crystal ball. We're just going to expect you to keep a safe work environment even when we don't have detailed regulations. We'll talk more about the general duty clause as we go forward. So now we're going to talk a little bit about specific standards. Um, one of the standards that is important, well, you can see that there's, there's lots. Uh, how are you going to lay out the work site? There are standards about that. How are you going to train your folks? There are standards about that. How are you going to provide medical examinations? Uh, how are we going to set standards uh, for, for workplace safety? Um, how are voluntary compliance programs going to be established? Um, how are emergency temporary standards? How are they going to work? And what are, what are those going to look like? And of course, those arise when something unexpected happens, or let me, let me say, in an industry, a new development happens or a new trend happens. Uh, OSHA becomes aware of it. They say, we've got to act. This is dangerous. We aren't going to be able to act quick enough using our ordinary process, which requires you know, a lot of investigation, uh, rulemaking, comment period. I mean, there's a fairly significant, at least months long and sometimes years long period from let's start thinking about this to let till we have a final standard. Sometimes that type of delay just isn't possible to, to wait. We need something right now. And so we're going to have maybe some temporary standards in place, almost like a placeholder until we get the permanent standards. Uh, employers are going to be required to follow those standards, but they also are going to be able to be, have, get a seat at the table to establish the final standards. This is one that I wanted to flag because it's an important one uh, to keep in mind, and it's a little bit surprising, I think, for folks when they hear this. OSHA requires that employers provide safety training for all new employees. That doesn't seem surprising. I mean, in an industrial environment, people need training from the very beginning for that first day before they handle that you know, chainsaw, before they walk out on, into the warehouse where um, forklifts are running around and things are in high shelves that might be falling or things along those lines. So that makes sense and I think most people in an industrial environment kind of assume that will happen. But this next part is the part that I think throws some folks. OSHA also requires that employers provide safety training to all employees who get transferred into new positions. And this is the kicker even if the transfer is for just one day. So let's say I work on assembly line A, almost always, that's my job, that's what I do. But several people on assembly line B have called off sick and we need some workers over there to do assembly line B stuff. 
I know how to do the work. It's very similar to what I'm doing on assembly line A. So it might be very natural for my supervisor to just say, hey, Groover, you're going to be over on assembly line B today. And so I move on over and I get into my workstation and I start doing my stuff. But you know what? There are some special safety concerns that are on assembly line B that don't happen to apply to assembly line A. Um, and I don't know about those because guess what? I don't work there. Well, obviously, my first day doing assembly blind B stuff is in some sense the most dangerous day. I'm not used to the layout. I'm not used to um, how things are done. I don't have a relationship with my colleagues to kind of know, you know, I haven't been able to see how they do certain things and kind of how the lay of the land is. And so it's especially important for that first day that I receive the training. It can't wait into the second or third or fourth day. And even if there isn't going to be a second or third or fourth day, maybe this is the only day I'll ever work on assembly line B, my safety is important. It's important to me, certainly, and to my family. But it's also important to my employer, or it should be important to my employer, and it's definitely important to OSHA. So you need to have that training before I sit down at my workstation or stand at my workstation and so that I know the particular safety issues that exist in my new job. Now, it doesn't mean I have to start training from the, from the beginning. If I've been working on assembly line A, I probably know most of the safety issues. I just need to be brought up to speed on the assembly line B issues. And this should be documented. There should be a record that I worked on assembly line B for this particular day and that before I uh, went to my workstation, I received training on whatever those unique safety issues might be. Um, we talked about how OSHA has specific standards, things like the benzene level that's safe and that general duty clause. Sometimes there will be, uh, well, the general duty clause, for example, is a general, not surprising, it's a general uh, uh, or general standard. Uh, there will also be more specific standards. For example, we might have um, a standard about what's a safe level of benzene in the working environment. Uh, the employer has to meet the general duty clause, but he also has to meet that specific safety standard. Um, the specific standard trumps the general standard. So the employer can't say, well, we think a higher level of benzene is perfectly safe. And so we're going to follow the general duty clause in that respect and not follow the specific regulation. Um, the specific regulation is more, um, needs to be complied with first. And then after you've complied with all the specific regulations, that's when the general duty clause kicks in and uh, ensures that you comply again on the other areas of, of opportunity of risk. And this, by the way, is a rule for statutory and regulatory interpretation in general. This is not unique to OSHA. More specific rules apply uh, first and then you apply the more general rules. Let me give you an example. You might have a statute that has a definition like this. Um, uh, children, in, um, children include um, the uh, adult or the, the, the uh, uh, offspring of um, a certain category of people. Maybe this is, uh, so let's say that somewhere in our statutory books, the definition of children is the offspring uh, of their antecedents. And this would include minors as well as people who've reached the age of majority. In other words, people over the age of 18. For example, I am over the age of 18, but I am still the child of my parents, right? So the, the word child has that kind of those two meanings. So let's say in our statutes, we've defined child to include anybody who is the offspring of somebody else. Then we look at a more specific statute that has to do with, say, drinking age. And in that statute, they, uh, uh, these, the uh, statutory writers defined child as somebody under the age of 18. And it says children cannot lawfully consume alcoholic beverages. Now, if you were to apply the more general definition that we find elsewhere in the statutes, that would mean nobody can drink alcoholic beverages because everybody's a child of somebody else, right? But of course, the um, legislature intended that the second, the more specific definition, the definition of people under the age of 21, be applied in that context. 
And so it just kind of makes sense that you would have this rule that the more specific, the more focused rule has to be followed first and the more general rule would be followed second. Here's an example of things that we have uh, uh, industry standards regarding just some examples that we see. And then let's get a little bit more granular. Here's some more specific standards. This one is the noise exposure standard. And you can see it's, it can be very specific. This is how much um, you know, uh, noise a person is not supposed to be exposed to. And it has record keeping requirements and it has training requirements and it has a safety gear aspects. So this is just one example of the many that are out there. So let's say that um, your, your uh, RSH is trying to build a case against your particular employer because of a violation of a safety standard. How does OSHA go about doing that? And it's, interesting, it's important to show, first of all, that OSHA is going to be doing this, not private citizens, not the individual employee who feels that he or she was endangered or harmed because of this. No, there is no private right of action under OSHA for the individual. Now, there may be other avenues that the individual can sue, for example, tort law or possibly some kind of state law. Certainly, workers' compensation might provide some remedies for the individual, but OSHA really isn't interested in giving money away, or not away, but providing money resources to individuals. It's interested in enforcement by the, uh, the OSHA authority. And so we're looking at what OSHA needs to do under these circumstances. So it needs to show that an applicable standard exists. That's usually not very hard. Um, that the standard was not complied with. In other words, the employer didn't do what the standard required. Uh, but they're not done at this point. I mean, this one's easy. This one may be more difficult. Um, actually, this is usually the sticking point. But sometimes uh, another one might be a sticking point. One or more employees was, were exposed to or had access to the hazard. Now you can see it's not necessary that any particular employee was actually injured. We just need the, the scenario in which it was possible that someone was injured. Maybe someone was injured, certainly that would satisfy this requirement. But it could be just someone was put in jeopardy and this particular occasion, nobody was hurt. But next time, maybe they will be. And finally, that the employer knew or should have known about the hazard. Uh, the hazard that the employee was exposed to. And it's important to keep in mind, should have known. And basically the employer is, for the most part, responsible for knowing everything that's going on in the workplace. So saying, I didn't know, is not a very compelling argument in most cases. There are a few fact patterns where you can advance that argument, but most employers are not gonna win by being able to prove that they did not know or, and they should not have known about the hazard. So usually we're gonna see that this being the area where an employer might be successful, possibly this area might be an area where an employer is gonna be successful. If an employer is trying to make this argument, it's probably not gonna work out too well for the employer. Does the Secretary of Labor in enforcing safety and health standards have to determine that the costs of the standard bear a reasonable relationship to the benefits? This is that cost benefit analysis that I talked about before. We can see this a US Supreme Court case. And the decision is no, there is no need for OSHA to prove that the safety fix that they are requiring is somehow or another less than the cost of the harm that would happen if um, there was no regulation in this area. You don't need to know the name of this case, but you do need to know that this is the rule. And here we have another way of looking at the rule. The U.S. Supreme Court held that Congress defined the basic relationship between costs and benefits by placing the benefit of the worker's health above all other considerations, including cost. And the U.S. Supreme Court then held in favor of OSHA under these circumstances. So now let's talk about the general duty clause. And this is actually the, the part that I'm gonna be most interested in us talking about because this applies everywhere. And this applies even if you are in a white collar office environment. Um, areas that we see the general duty clause being especially important can be in areas of repetitive stress. Things like a carpal tunnel, uh, people who type a lot or who do some kind of repetitive action, maybe even in, a, in an office type setting, can experience injuries, especially to their hands and to their wrists, uh, that can cause problems. You can also see problems with respect to back and other injuries by sitting or standing in a particular style or 
location for an extended period of time. Um, and so these can present issues. There can also be issues about the quality of the air in a particular facility. Um, is there sufficient um, air cleaning that's happening? Is there a sufficient uh, process by which air comes in and goes out of the building, those types of issues. OSHA has attempted at times to develop uh, regulations in these areas and they may well in the future be successful. At this point though, there haven't been final rulemaking in these areas in part because they are so controversial. Uh, the science can be questioned by some people and can be interpreted in different ways. And so there hasn't been the, the finalization in these areas. Of course, if that happens at some point, then these topics will move out of the general duty category and they will have specific uh, regulations that, that we would need to comply with. But for now, they are remaining in the general duty scenario. And this is what the general duty clause provides. Each employer shall furnish to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to the employees. So free of recognized hazards. These are some important words. Here's a kind of a definition of the general duty clause. It's a provision of the act. This is OSHA. When I say act, I mean OSHA, the OSHA act. Requiring the employees furnished to each employee, employ, each employee employment and a place of employment. For, actually, this is just basically the, the, the definition from the statute. We put quotes around this. An employer is deemed to have constructive knowledge. Let's pause here and talk about the word constructive. Let's go back for a second and look at something that we've already talked about. We talked about should have known here. This is really constructive knowledge. You know what? I don't know what you know and you don't know what I know in our heads. I could say I've never heard that before and I might be lying. And you really, in most cases, can't prove that I am lying. But what I can know is what you ought to know. You ought to know, if you're a student at Collin College, you ought to know that we have three campuses, three big campuses. We've got one in Plano that we call Spring Creek, one in Frisco that we call Preston Ridge. We have one in McKinney called Central Park. Um, I don't know that you knew that before I just said that, but I, it's something you ought to know and it's something most folks do know. Uh, maybe you don't know it in your first day at Collin College, but you're gonna figure that out. So I would describe that as constructive knowledge. I can't say for sure you actually have that actual knowledge, but I can say you should have that knowledge. It's reasonable for me to assume you have that knowledge. Um, other knowledge that would be constructive knowledge would be, I assume you know your times tables. Um, I assume that you know seven times eight is 56. I don't know that for a fact. I suppose it's possible that you suffered some you know, head injury and somehow or another you've forgotten that fact. Uh, so I can't, I can't go into your brain and definitely know that you have that actual knowledge unless I test you. But I would say that it's, it's something you should know that you have constructive knowledge about. So that's how it works with employers. They are deemed to have constructive knowledge as opposed to actual knowledge of a recognized hazard if the industry recognizes hazards even if the employer does not actually know about it. So imagine you have an employer. This employer's never heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, it doesn't think about designing its uh, workstations in any particular way. It can honestly testify, gosh, let, let's say OSHA uh, cites them for this. Gosh, I had I never even heard of carpal tunnel before. I never even heard that you could be injured by using a keyboard in a particular way. Gosh, I'm completely surprised by this. Well, I mean, the employer can say that, and certainly OSHA isn't going to be able to prove actual knowledge, even though maybe we might think to ourselves, well, I'm not sure I believe that employer. But even if the employer is being completely honest, or at least OSHA can't prove that they're being dishonest, OSHA can still attack them from the constructive knowledge perspective. OSHA can say, well, maybe that's true. Maybe you really didn't know you idiot, but you, ha you were supposed to know. It's actually in a way almost worse that you didn't know uh, because if you had known, at least you could have been working on it or thinking about it on some level. And because you didn't know, you didn't even know to even think about this topic. So the lack of knowledge really doesn't provide a lot of protection. But let's th think of a way that we could have um, 
a lack of constructive knowledge. Let's say that there is some kind of virus or some kind of illness that develops all of a sudden in the workplaces. And um, uh, it's a, a new development, something that people haven't been exposed to. Um, well, the let's say that uh, uh, if the employer had known about this, the employer would have been sure to give everybody, you know, uh, hand wipes or antibacterial hand lotions uh, to reduce the spread of this particular virus. Um, but the employer didn't because the employer didn't have actual knowledge about this condition and he didn't have constructive knowledge because this was just a very new development. And so under those circumstances, the employer is excused under the general duty clause for not having addressed that particular issue. So let's look at what OSHA has to prove when the OSHA is uh, attempting to cite an employer for a violation of the general duty clause. Okay, well the first thing OSHA has to prove is a workplace hazard was allowed to exist. Okay, um, the next that the hazard was or should have been recognized by the employer. Again, this is that constructive knowledge of the hazard. The hazard caused or was likely to cause death or serious, a serious physical injury and feasible means exist to abate the hazard and were not used. So if you are in a, in a workplace, a white collar type workplace, an office type setting, this is probably where your biggest OSHA risk is going to be. And so if you have a, an employee who comes to HR and says, I'm, my wrists are hurting. I type a lot and I'm just having a lot of discomfort with my wrists. Think OSHA. Think the general duty clause. That's probably one of the areas where HR does need to be aware of OSHA requirements. Another area that we see um, an important level of emphasis is workplace violence. Um, employers should have a zero tolerance. Um, they should establish a, a zero tolerance for any kind of workplace violence and they should provide a complaint process for employees uh, to let the employer knows when there is the potential for violence. And in this area, we're not just talking about terrorist events or the crazies. We're talking about fist fights because people get mad at one another. We're talking about um, uh, spousal abuse and boyfriend girlfriend abuse. Uh, so it's a, a broader uh, perspective. We're talking about uh, customer abuse. We're talking about crimes. Imagine, for example, that you have a chain of convenience stores that are open late at night. Uh, there is a chance, certainly, that a, a bad person, a criminal, will come into your facility and uh, harm, shoot, um, beat up your employees. Obviously, you don't want that to happen. But it is a realistic uh, danger when you happen to be in that type of industry um, and you happen to be open late at night. And so you need to have uh, some opportunities for how you're going to address those issues. Uh, things like signs that say, you know, little cash on hand, having cameras, having things very well lit, um, having panic buttons, things like that can be ways of limiting those risks. And certainly having a complaint process makes sense as well. You want to have a bullying policy in effect. Um, bullying can definitely lead to higher workers' compensation costs and injuries because people can feel uh, pressure to do things in certain ways that maybe aren't as safe or they may avoid doing something the safe way because they're concerned about having to interact with that particular person or something along those lines. Another aspect is the, uh, uh, the prohibition against retaliation. Um, like most of these particular statutes, retaliation is prohibited against people who complain. Um, OSHA investigates companies in kind of two different ways. One way that it investigates is just by having kind of random checks. But another way, and this is probably the more common way, is that they will respond to employee complaints um, about the work workforce, the, the placement of, of um of things. Um, many times the employer has a pretty good idea who dropped a dime on it. Maybe the employee has already complained internally about the issue or maybe the employer the employee is just very um, 
difficult and and uh, aggressive and just happens to be the type of person that would likely to be call, calling the administ OSHA administration to look into that issue. Um, and there's a temptation to retaliate against the person, um, uh, but please, please be careful not to avoid that. That is a path you don't want to go down. Um, so in this situation, the employee does have the opportunity to allege uh, or to advance a, a, a claim against uh, the employer uh, for retaliation. So what does the employee need to prove, or the former employee in many cases under these circumstances, that he or she engaged in a protected activity, in other words, blew the whistle, contacted OSHA under these circumstances, that the employer knew about the activity, and that the employer subjected it should be him, not high. Sorry about that. Him or her to an adverse action as a result of the uh, the activity, the, the protected activity, and that that protected activity contributed to, to whatever that adverse action is. You can see the word here is contributed. So let's say that you know Bob was on the banana slip, you know, out the door already. He whistle blew. Maybe he blew the whistle in part because he thought that would buy him. Uh, a longer service, you know, oh, well, they're not going to fire me when there's a social complaint out there. Bob may actually uh, proudly tell people that he's the one who blew the whistle in the hopes that that will in encourage the employer not to act on him because they'd be worried about a retaliation claim. Well, in that situation, there may be other reasons why the employer was about ready to, f to fire Bob. But if his whistleblowing was a factor or contributed to that decision, that's what makes it unlawful. In other words, it doesn't have to be the only reason that the employer was looking to take that action. Okay, let's consider employer defenses to OSHA claims. Uh, we already talked about kind of that de minimis violation category. And this is when the violation of the safety rule has no direct or immediate relationship to safety or health. We call this violation de minimis, meaning it's more of a, a paperwork of violation than anything else. And the argument can be made that an OSHA citation isn't appropriate under those circumstances. Another issue is when there's unforeseeable employee misconduct. You know, the reality is when we have employees, they are not always going to do exactly what we want them to do, right? Not, they're not always going to do exactly how we train them to do things. Imagine for a second that I'm working on assembly line A, and there are detailed rules about how I'm supposed to do this in a safe way. And if I follow all of the rules, my productivity is going to be about 10 widgets an hour. But you know what? If I kind of shave off a few of those rules, I can do 15 an hour. And I may be being paid higher, but based upon the number of widgets that I do. And so it's very likely that I'll start cutting corners, maybe not doing everything that I'm supposed to. And you know what? Most of the time, there's not going to be any safety implications. Um, I'm not going to get hurt. I might be able to uh, take some of these shortcuts for years before I have a single injury. And so I start getting cocky, honestly. I start thinking to myself, hey, you know, it's okay. I don't, I don't have to do that particular rule because, look, I've been doing it for six months and I haven't had a single injury. And you may never have an injury. Uh, the, the thing about OSHA regulations are that, um, you know, they don't have rules just when there's a 100% chance that if you don't follow it, you're going to get hurt. It may be that there's only a 1% or 2% chance you'll get injured. Uh, but if you're the one who falls into that 1% or 2% chance, it's a big deal to you and certainly a big deal to OSHA and to the employer. And so uh, there is regular, I'm sorry about that, there is regular opportunity for, for employees to cut corners. But you know what? That's foreseeable. It's foreseeable that employees will do this because if you happen to have employees, you've seen them cut these types of corners. So in order to uh, be able to present the defense that, hey, you know what? Bob, Bob was injured, sure, but he wasn't following the safety rules. We trained him. We told him how to do it, and he wasn't following the rules. Well, OSHA is going to say, well, but didn't you kind of know he wasn't following the rules? I mean, this wasn't the first time he didn't follow the rules. He'd been failing to take those steps for the last 10 years. You mean to say nobody noticed? Well, maybe nobody did notice, but they should have noticed. They, you had constructive knowledge that Bob was cutting corners in this area. It was completely foreseeable because he'd done it forever. And even if Bob had never done it before, Larry and Teresa 
had been doing it and Susan had been doing it. And so you can't say it was unforeseeable when people were doing it or when kind of common sense tells you this is something that employees are not are going to not necessarily want to do and are not going to do on a consistent basis. So you have to police folks. You have to say, Bob, I know you don't want to do X, Y, and Z, but you got to. That's the rule. And you need to have consequences. So you need to have established work rules that prevent the violation. You need to communicate those rules to the employees. You need to monitor to make sure that they aren't doing those and you have to enforce the rules. Now this is going to sound weird. So bear with me for a second. OSHA wants you to fire people. They want these rules to have some teeth with it. So if every time you catch Bob not doing A, B, and C, you say, hey, Bob, let's go ahead and do A, B, and C. And Bob says, okay. And he does A, B, and C for the next two or three days. And then he goes back to his old pattern. And then uh, you, you happen to notice a few months later he's not doing A, B, C. Hey, Bob, let's go ahead and do A, B, C. Okay. I'm going to do ABC, and he does it for a little while longer than he stops. OSHA's very unimpressed by that. OSHA says, wait a second. You gave Bob a warning. What did you tell, was, what did you tell Bob was going to happen if he did this again? Uh, I didn't say anything. Well, then wasn't it pretty foreseeable that Bob was going to fall back into his old pattern? Uh, yeah. So did you monitor Bob 24-7 to make sure he's not doing this? Uh, no. So you really were, you were telling him not to do it, but you knew he was going to go back to his old pattern, didn't you? Uh, kind of. You can see how that's not a very persuasive argument. So you need to have rules and they have to have teeth. So when you catch Bob doing it, you pull him aside, you, you give him maybe a verbal warning. Hey, Bob, you know, got to do this. Next time you don't do this, I'm going to have to suspend you for a day. Or I'm going to have to, uh, uh, give you some kind of formal disciplinary proceeding and you won't be eligible to post for jobs for the next two months. Um, and then, okay, Bob goes back to work and he does it again. Okay, Bob, well, um, I'm going to have to suspend you for a week this time. Ooh, okay. Now Bob's understanding this is big deal. And next time, Bob, you're fired. You need to have teeth and you need to actually follow through. The threats have to result in action. And you may think Bob is a great worker. He may be very productive. But OSHA wants to see you fire Bob if he continues to violate the policies. Because, um, number one, Bob is too risky for the work environment that you have. Number two, Larry and Teresa and Samantha will see that Bob has been fired. And so they are going to take very seriously when you say, hey, guys, everybody needs to do one A, B, and C. Well, guess what? They're going to be motivated to do it. So this is an unusual statute in that the um, you know, usually the government's kind of rooting for the employee. Hey, don't fire that guy. Give him another chance, right? But this is a situation where the the reverse can be the effect, the, the case that the safer course of action for the employer is to dismiss rather than to retain a dangerous employee. Other things. This is kind of similar to the unforeseen employee misconduct. This is recklessness on the part of the employee. Conscious disregard for safety, conscious failure to use due care. Sometimes employees do crazy things. They're roughhousing, they're engaged in horseplay. They're just a daredevil. They're kind of like the evil Knievel of the work, working environment. And sometimes when they do these dangerous things, people get badly hurt. The greater hazard defense. I talked about this earlier. I didn't use the name, but this is what I was talking about when I said sometimes doing what you're supposed to do under OSHA regulations um, uh, are greater than than not doing doing something else. So you know, for example, OSHA tells you to do X. If you do X, there's a risk that people are going to get hurt. So you want to do Y because you think Y is going to be safer. But if you do Y the nature of whatever Y is precludes you doing X. And so um, you can make the argument that the greater hazard defense applies. So this is when an employee may use the greater hazard defense of an OSHA violation where the hazards of compliance, in other words, the hazards of doing what OSHA says are greater than the hazards of non-compliance. When again, non-compliance means you're doing something else, you, you're applying a, a more state-of-the-art technology perhaps to reduce that risk impossibility. Every now and again it's just physically impossible to do what the OSHA rules require because of the particular uh, nature of your uh, uh, 
place or, or you know literally it just will not work there again a cost can't be too much of a factor in this area so uh, this isn't a very common category now we have the economic infeasibility in light of the custom and practice of the industry an employer may defend non-compliance on the ground that is economically infeasible to comply but remember our Donovan case earlier let me flip it over here um, uh, American textile manufacturers Institute versus Donovan they said we don't care about costs so uh, that is a difficult argument to make you certainly can present evidence that economic that this is really economically infeasible but I wouldn't hang my hat and that have that be my only basis for uh, challenging uh, the particular action by OSHA. Then, of course, there's a statute of limitations. This is one one piece of good news for employers. It's only six months. OSHA has to act pretty quickly when it has a, knows about a violation. Let's consider the scenario. Coyote Tools takes all reasonable precautions to guard employees against known hazards in its production facilities. However, Bob, an employee, found many of the precautions too cumbersome to follow. Bob is injured when he circumvents these precautions. Coyote uh, tools will not be liable as the harm or may not I'm gonna say may not be liable because the harm as a res uh, because will not be reliable as the harm as a result of reckless behavior on Bob's part um, but again if it's a foreseeable misconduct situation and he was doing this for a while and, and the supervisor was in a position to see that Bob was doing this then coyote tools may well be liable so this is a uh, I could see this cutting either way. May an employee willfully use a self-help remedy to refuse to follow an employee, employer's direction in the workplace? The answer is yes. I'm not going to go through the specifics of this case. You don't need to know the name. It is a U.S. Supreme Court case. Um, but in this case, the workers uh, had observed that there was this dangerous thing that their employer was asking them to do and in fact others had been badly injured as a result of, of doing what they were supposed to do so the worker said well, we're not doing it that's not safe and we don't care if you're telling us we have to do it because we're just not and uh, the employer took disciplinary action against them well uh, the the OSHA uh, said no you can't do that that's retaliation employers are entitled to display a work objective if it would violate the general duty clause or any of the specific duty requirements so uh, you this might seem like an insubordination case but if employees are saying I won't do this because I don't think it's safe that's where we're gonna see OSHA issues and the possibility of a retaliation claim so this is again another area where HR does need to be aware that um, uh, employment action can have OSHA implications even though probably no one is using the term OSHA in this discussion but it doesn't matter if the employee isn't saying I think that the general duty clause is being violated here no the employee says I I'm not going to do that because I don't think it's safe uh, the HR department ought to be thinking OSHA retaliation and should uh, tell the employee thank you for bringing it to our attention no of course you shouldn't do that let's look into the matter more fully Okay, let's consider the issue of prevention and enforcement. Um, so, as we said before, there's kind of two ways that um, the OSHA agency gets involved in enforcement. One is complaints by employees, um, and that usually results in, in an investigation. Um, another is inspections by OSHA. There's actually kind of a third category. Um, they, they're, they would actually put it into this bucket, but let me just share this with you. Sometimes uh, employers have to report particular levels of injury or death to OSHA. And so certainly with those reports, OSHA is you know quite likely to investigate those in more details let's say you have a a workplace situation where somebody is killed in the works workplace because of a malfunctioning equipment or something like that I believe the rule is that the employer has to report it to OSHA within eight hours of the death of the employee well it's pretty safe bet that OSHA is going to be there pretty darn soon to inspect and to investigate that particular matter. I guess that would fit into this category, but in some sense, it's also a complaint. Certainly the passed away person has a pretty serious complaint under those circumstances. 
Most inspections are going to be unannounced, and this is even true if it's an employee complaint because in many cases the employee doesn't let you know that he or she has a concern. He or she calls OSHA, many times the call is going to be anonymous. And so OSHA doesn't then tell you, hey, babe, by the way, we got a complaint yesterday, so we'll be over in a few days. No, it's going to be unannounced. They're going to show up at the door and you're going to have to respond to it. This is another area where it's important that you know how to handle these things beforehand because once they're knocking on your door you can't say hey you know what uh, thanks for coming I'll be back in a, in a couple hours I need to get advice about how to handle this no you have to wing it at that point and hopefully and of course you're nervous <laughs> you're not quite sure what's going on but you have to proceed with the visit as is and there's not going to be the opportunity for you to do much if any prep at that particular time I mean you might have five minutes that you can look over some material in your office but it's kind of drop everything and address this issue now unless there's an emergency situation the employer can require OSHA to uh, obtain a search warrant um, that is something that you can consider doing um, but it's usually not done by employers because obviously if OSHA is required to get a search warrant, it's going to approach its second visit in a very different demeanor than the first visit. It's going to assume that the employer needed needed that extra time to get things squared away. So when it does come, it's going to be a more hostile meeting and it's going to be a more in-depth uh, in inspection and it's much more likely that they will take even relatively small violations and make them a bigger deal so you've, you've made the relationship very adversarial by doing that now that doesn't mean you don't need to do that sometimes I mean if your workforce if your workplace is going to you know that it's not going to do well in inspection it may make sense to uh, demand the search warrant and really work on remediation up until the search warrant can issue. Now OSHA can get the search warrant probably in a matter of hours, maybe even in a matter of an hour or so. So you're not going to have a long time to, um, to, to get your house in order. So as I say, generally speaking, most businesses are going to welcome OSHA in. Welcome, of course, uh, maybe the wrong word, but permit the inspection to go forward. I'm not going to discuss the Irving case. I don't think it's that relevant to our um, issues. So um, one of the big things that the employer, uh, that OSHA is going to look for the employer to do is have rules, workplace rules. And these aren't going to be the same as the OSHA rules because these are going to be the, the rules that the employees follow in the day-to-day -day, uh, work environment. So they need to be presented in a way that the employees can understand and that the employees will be expected to follow those rules with consequences being clear. Training needs to be from the very beginning and there needs to be refreshers from time to time. The, uh, the particular rules are also going to be very specific to the work, work for this particular workforce. It's going to vary depending upon um, how your particular workforce is uh, configured. So you might have a rule that says forklifts can't go down this, this particular aisle. Well, obviously there's no OSHA rule that says forklifts can't go down that particular aisle, this particular place of employment. It's an application of an OSHA rule to a particular workforce or workplace setting. So the safety rules should be clear, specific, consistent with one another, and strictly enforced. There needed to be consequences. Um, it's a good idea to have a safety program in place and to have a safety team. It's also a good idea, OSHA loves this, when you have employees who are um, involved, the actual workers are involved in uh, creating the safety rules. Uh, OSHA likes that for several reasons. Number one, the people doing the work are the experts. They know what's in potentially dangerous and they know how to potentially address those issues. Plus, if the workers are involved in creating the standards, they're going to get more buy-in. They're going to be more willing to comply if they think to themselves, oh yeah, Bob, he's, he's in our group. He helped draft this, so he's a good guy. He knows the drill. Um, if he says this is what we need to do, I'm inclined to accept him. 
versus having a bunch of, you know, industrial engineers from outside come in and evaluate or have the supervisors come up with the rules. Well, I don't know what we do here. Why should we listen to them? That type of idea. That's not what you want to have going on. Uh, so you want to have buy-in. You want to have the experts be involved in the rule. Now I'm going to pause here for a second and show you a connection that is important, electromation. You may recall this from the module that we talked about for, uh, when we were in uh, the labor law. Electromation is an important case, and it actually had to do with safety groups. When you have um, safety groups that are uh, including people who are in non-management positions, people who could unionize, um, and they are advising management about how safety rules ought to be drafted, uh, processes that ought to happen in the, this particular environment. Sometimes these safety groups can start looking like quasi-unions. There's almost the appearance of negotiation. The safety group made up of assembly line workers start saying, well, I think we need more space. Um, we have too many workers on this assembly line and it is creating safety issues. I keep on elbowing Bob, who I'm sitting next to, and uh, when he twists that lug nut, um, it uh, sometimes hits my my shoulder or something along those lines. And so we need to have, instead of, you know, a three-foot space between workers or whatever, we need to have a four-foot space. Um, and then maybe the, the, the company comes back and says, well, maybe three and a half will work. What do you think? Well, that starts sounding like a negotiations, contractual negotiations. And in the electromation course a case, the, the court said, you know what, you can't really have these types of groups because because they aren't unions and the employer usually selects the workers who are in are on these particular work groups and so they start looking like a company union and in fact these safety groups are oftentimes implemented in part by employers to um, uh, as a union avoidance approach. The message that the employer is trying to send to workers, hey, you already have a voice here. Uh, when you have safety concerns, we address them. When you, uh, and we take you seriously, we respect what you can contribute to the workforce, what your expertise tells you about how we ought to do things. And so why do you need a union? Because the union would just do what you're already doing here and you don't have to pay anybody to, to get this benefit. So there, it is true, and Electromation did capture the notion that this is a union avoidance uh, technique. But OSHA loves this stuff. So this is an example about how safety law or OSHA law and labor law can kind of butt up against each other. Let me give you another example. Uh, this is actually one that I confronted in my practice. Um, we had, um, in one of my uh, previous lives when I was practicing, I, I represented an industrial environment and um, there were a group of employees in this environment who were deaf and hard of hearing and they uh, had been working at this facility for a very long time and this facility promotions were handled based upon a seniority if you had the, the correct number of years of employment you would be the first person and you applied for a particular job you'd be the first person considered and assuming you had the qualifications for the job then you would be eligible to get the job well in this facility some of the most valued jobs in the facility were being forklift operator it was um, a, a, an e quote unquote easy job you know you weren't walking around you weren't hustling you weren't lifting stuff you were riding around in a basically a little mini car so it wasn't nearly as physically demanding and since these were the highly sought after jobs they were jobs that uh, people with a lot of service would get so these were older individuals sometimes in their 50s or 60s you know their bodies weren't quite as fit or as energetic as they once were and so they appreciated not having to run around eight hours a day doing a physical work these jobs were also some of the most highly compensated in the particular uh, facility uh, there was a prestige factor associated with it they were an easier job to do and they were more highly compensated so as you can imagine once an employee had that sufficient seniority to post for one of these jobs almost invariably he or she did so well, as I said before, in this particular facility, there were lots of deaf and hard of hearing employees who had a lot of service. And so they got to the point that they became eligible for posting into these jobs. The, um, they, they claimed that um, the uh, uh, 
Americans with Disabilities Act required that the employer to reasonably accommodate their hearing loss, uh, perhaps by having um, uh, uh, you know, flashing lights around so that uh, people could see when they were approaching and so that they could, uh, you know, if there, there might be some blind spots where they had to come in and, and uh, you know, so they, they couldn't necessarily hear that other people were in that area. So they, they might have a, a, a louder noise associated with the machine or, or the flashing lights so that people in the area would see them. And so it was less important that they would see these workers who might be, um, you know, making noises that couldn't be heard by the uh, forklift operators. Um, and so that was the idea that uh, the, the um, EOC had. We can uh, reasonably accommodate this by putting on lights, by uh, putting uh, other features on it, by maybe having some uh, mirrors put up in, in, in blind spots so that the workers could uh, see um, as they were turning a corner or something like that. These seem like reasonable accommodations to accommodate the disability of deafness or hard of hearing. OSHA, on the other hand, said, no way, no how, not going to happen, because this does create a safety issue. A deaf forklift driver is, statistically speaking, going to have more accidents than a typical hearing forklift driver. And so OSHA said, uh-uh, no, you can't have a forklift driver who is hard of hearing. Now, interestingly, these workers would drive to work. They had a driver's license uh, just like anybody else. They could absolutely drive a car um, going, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, but they couldn't drive a forklift that was going 10 miles an hour in the industrial working environment. So you can see how sometimes the Americans Disabilities Act and OSHA can conflict. Um, generally speaking, you want to cross, you, you, you're, you're, it, the safer path is to tick off the EOC over ticking off OSHA. Um, so, uh, and of course, one of the defenses to the, EOC, to the uh, ADA is, you know, a law that precludes you from complying with this um, uh, particular statute. And so, and in those cases, an employer can say, well, we can't reasonably accommodate because the OSHA rules prohibit um, a deaf or hard of hearing uh, person from from operating this particular equipment. So what I'm trying to show to you here with these two examples is that there is a connection between some of these statutes and sometimes these statutes can kind of butt heads. And this is another area where the HR department becomes important because you have the OSHA folks saying no, you have the HR folks saying yes, you need to have somebody who has at least some level of understanding of both so that you can talk through the issues and decide how to approach it. If you happen to encounter these particular issues, though, I definitely encourage you to get an attorney involved to help you maneuver through these concerns. So here are some examples of safety programs that you'd want to uh, consider as you're developing these types of, of issues. And you can see one of the issues is obtain employee commitment, use safety and health committees, and again, structure to also comply with the National Labor Relations Act. Employers concern, uh, covered by the Act must maintain records for OSHA compliance. This is another big deal. There's reports, uh, and it depends upon the workplace what type of report you need to do, uh, but when you have, what, whichever your type is, you need to make sure that you're keeping these records timely and that you keep the records for the period of time that you need to. And typically in these documents, you're going to record when accidents happen. But separate from the actual OSHA 300 log and things like that, is you're going to want to document the training that your employees receive. Most likely you'll document that in their personnel files. Uh, so it may not be on an OSHA form uh, or an OSHA log, but you'll want to refer to that to show, yeah, you know, Bob was trained about how to use the forklift machinery. He received, you know, four hours of training before he got on that forklift that first time. And you've got, got that documented. And you perhaps even issue things like uh, driver's licenses, uh, a pretty common thing you'll see in a forklift environment, where they actually have to carry them around with them to show, yes, I have this credential. And if they have an accident, they lose. Their, their, their uh, driver's license or the forklift license gets suspended for some period of time. Um, and uh, you know, there's a penalty, as a consequence for that violation. Um, 
Employees must, must be informed of their OSHA rights by their employer, and this is usually done through posters, just like we've had the Title VII poster, the uh, a Polygraphed Act poster, the um, um, Age Discrimination and uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act poster, the Americans with Disabilities Act poster, the Workers' Comp poster, and you can see there's more and more and more of these. Well, you need to have an OSHA poster as well. Uh, you may also want to include information in your employee handbook. And it's a good idea to per periodically remind employees about these issues through, um, you know, staff meetings and things along those lines. And of course, you're going to want to document that you talked about these things because this is the type of stuff that OSHA eats up. There are fines with violations. I mean, you know, hopefully employers want to comply with these rules because they want to be a good employer. They want their employees to be safe, healthy, happy um, in the workplace. But there is not only the, the, the carrot, there's also the stick, the possibility of fines. And these fines can be very, very significant. An employee representative has the right to accompany an OSHA compliance officer when the OSHA compliance officer uh, does do the inspection, but the representative can't control where the officer goes. Um, the officer can go where he or she wishes to, and the representative should not intimidate or interfere with the performance of the officer's job. The officer is probably going to be taking pictures, going to be taking notes. Um, the, the representative for the employer should be also taking pictures. So when the the uh, op the appliance officer takes a picture, the employee ought to take pictures um, from the same vantage point that the officer did, but also potentially from other vantage points. Because you know when you have the full range of views of that particular setup, it may look a little differently when you uh, have different camera angles. So you want to have as complete a record of what was seen and what was recorded as possible. You also want to uh, take careful notes about what the uh, officer looks at even if he doesn't take pictures so that you can maybe try to figure out well what was he thinking what was he finding interesting there um, and so all this requires a lot of very careful documentation obviously you want to be a gracious host to the compliance officer you know you want to offer him coffee or some water or whatever um, you don't want to obviously you want to appear to be bribing him or her you want to appear to be a gracious host but this is a a stressful situation Situation. This is something that uh, is in some sense adversarial. The officer certainly understands that and while he or she is likely to be polite, um, he or she understands that, that he is there to find violations and you're there to hopefully stop him from finding violations. And so there's a bit of a dance in these circumstances. Both people are being relatively polite to the other, but um, there, this isn't a friendly, happy little meeting here. Uh, happening between the parties. Um, citations very possibly will issue under these circumstances and um, when uh, the citation issues are certainly a period of time where the employer can contest them. Um, the employer may choose to contest, the employer may choose not to contest. Um, there will usually be an abatement period that the employer has. The abatement period is the time that the employer is given to fix the problem. Um, obviously, sometimes the problem can be fixed almost immediately, but other times it may involve uh, building things or moving things, and you can't just do that at the snap of your hands. And so you need to keep track of uh, the amount of time that you have to make the changes that are necessary. not going to talk about the, this particular case. So at this point, we're going to end the presentation. I hope that this has been helpful for you. In the next presentation, we'll discuss the other topics. Um, I thank you for your attention. If you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu. I'd be delighted to talk to you in more detail about OSHA requirements. Or alternatively, stop by and we can talk face-to-face uh, -face or over the telephone about this. Again, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.